welcome back for our afternoon session. It's one minute past 1.15, so I think we'll get going. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Miss Charlotte Holmes, who's an ST3 in the Northeast region. Uh, Miss Holmes is a cardiothoracic trainee, and she's going to, with a very um, interesting career so far, she's a president of her, her surgical society. She's won the John Parker Medal for one of her presentations at STTS. And Miss Holmes is going to share with us um, insights on how to be competitive for ST1 entry, which is the beginning of run through. So, which is um, a, which is one of the thing, features of cardiothoracic training. So, over to you, Miss Holmes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, my name is Charlotte, and I'm a cardiothoracic registrar in the North East Deanery. Um, I've been asked to talk to you today about applying for cardiothoracic training um, and how to make yourself as competitive as possible for ST1 entry. So I'm going to describe what the training programme looks like, how you apply, what the application process looks like, how to make yourself as competitive applicant as possible, and just some general advice and tips that I wish I had at the time. So this is what the training programme looks like, although it's um, slightly out of date and I'll, I will talk to you about that. So after your medical school degree and your foundation programme, there's two pathways of entry, ST1 application or course surgical training year one and two and then applying for ST3 entry. Um, it, it says here that it's um, ST1 to eight or ST3 to eight, um, but as of August 2021, there's plans to shorten the training to seven years. Um, you can apply from course surgical training to apply for ST1 and come out of that programme in order to join specialty training, that is an option. Um, by the end of CST2 or ST2, you need your MRCS, your membership to the Royal College of Surgeons exam. And by the end of ST8, you need your fellowship to the Royal College of Surgeons exam in cardiothoracics. And then by the end of your training, you'll be, hopefully receive your certificate of completion of training and then can apply for consultant posts. Although um, most choose to do fellowships, subspecialise, such as in congenital or transplant, in order to gain further clinical experience prior to consultantship. Um, there are academic pathways, um, there's the foundation academic programmes, there's also academic clinical fellowships in specialty training. Now specialties um, um, put bids in in order to have these posts and there isn't always one in, in the specialty um, so it's worth keeping an eye out for that. Um, there's information on NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research, on where those posts are and what specialties they're in. Um, what an academic clinical fellowship is, is during your first three years of training, you get up to nine months of allocated research time to pursue a postgraduate qualification in research. Um, you still need to achieve your um, training competencies um, as with your uh, clinical counterparts within that time frame, just like in foundation. And so it's important to bear that in mind um, with the hopes that at some point during your training, you'll go out of programme to do a PhD uh, and during your senior years, a senior in your lectureship um, in order to pursue a career as an academic surgeon. If you um, choose uh, later on that you want to do an academic career and you have a research CV, um, you can still apply at, at a certain point in your training to go out of programme to do it. A PhD it is possible without a fellowship in research um, to pursue an academic career. How does the application process work? It's done by national selection and what that means is it's centrally done by one deanery and that's currently the Wessex Deanery. If you google Wessex Deanery Cardiothoracics it should come up otherwise this is the web link and that's the resource for all your information on the dates for applying, the posts that there are that year and the resources on um, the person specification so what type of trainee they're looking for, the scoring matrix um, for how your application is scored and I'll go into that in more detail later and just details about the interview and the application process that's all on that website. The applications usually open in November for the next academic year with the jobs being advertised a week before. The application process is usually open for about a month in cardiothoracics from my experience but it is advertised on the dates on the website so keep an eye on that date of closure and it does vary between specialties and currently that's being done on the oral application platform. So this is just a quick look at what the application form looks like and there's more pages than this um, but it's, it's all based on your CV based on the scoring matrix which we'll go through in more detail um, and you really, there's a few um, boxes and you, want, you will want to put your highest scoring um, 
information in there and I'll go through that with the matrix and there's also some blank spaces to talk about anything else that's relevant so it's important to really put all of your CV into this application form um, it looks quite complicated and quite scary and I don't mind saying that when I applied in foundation year two I didn't get invited to interview and it's not that I didn't have enough points on my CV I did I just didn't make the most out of it in this application form I did it alone but when I sought a mentor to help me with the application, who helps go through my CV in the application form and just make sure I really crammed everything in there, it was then that I got invited to interview. So it's really important to seek help with this and don't do that alone. Um, after the application is submitted, you'll be long listed. And that just means that they're checking you've got a medical degree and you're either in foundation or have achieved your foundation competencies. They then score your application and that's short listing. Um, so there is a matrix that I'm going to we go through that's scored by three assessors out of 40 so a maximum of 120 points when i applied the, the cutoff score was around 64 i think it does vary but it's usually around this figure if you achieve that score on the matrix um, you're invited to interview which are usually held in february in southampton and that's separated into three parts a communication station where you may have to speak to an anxious relative or explain an operation to a patient or um, apologize for cancellation of an operation. There's then a structured um, question station, which has um, six questions based on topics such as research and audit, clinical scenarios, information governance, teaching. And it's really important on that station, not just to answer the questions closely, but relate that to your CV and your experience so that you can talk about what you've achieved as how you know the answers to those questions. And there is a resource that I'll talk about later, which will help you structure those answers ahead of time. There's then a clinical skills station with three clinical skills, um, BATS, thoroscopic skills, knot tying, and excision of a, a lesion and wound closure. Um, so that's um, important to do your basic surgical skills course um, during foundation in order to learn those skills and you also learn them on your surgical jobs. Each part of the application, the matrix score and each part of the interview is worth 25% of your overall ranking and the surgical skills are separated into smaller percentages of that. Um, and that's again um, part of the information on the West 16 website. website. Um, so then you're ranked against everyone at interview and then they open the prefacing window. And that means you rank the deaneries on the order of your preference of, of job. Um, they then match you by ranking and preference and hopefully fingers crossed you've got the job. When they open that preferencing window, it's really important to read the document they send on the deaneries. So it, they'll confirm the deaneries where their jobs are um, and they'll show, tell you in that document well, what the ST1, ST2 programme looks like in that deanery, the education, all the resources they have on offer there and what the training looks like. Um, the ST1, ST2 programme varies per deanery on what experience you have, so it's really important to read that document and, and see where you'd like to go. Um, I chose the North East because in the first year you get four months in cardiothoracics and the whole year in ST2, some deaneries you get six months in ST, uh, ST2. So it's really important to read through that document carefully and choose where you'd like to go. So having a look at the post this year, when I applied there was 10 posts in cardiothoracics and an academic post for ST1 and ST3 there were 5 posts. This year there's 8 training posts, a mixture of ST1 and ST3. Um, there is more focus, um, I should have mentioned when um, I talked about the training programme, on ST1 entry. Um, but there are still ST3 posts available. Um, these posts vary um, every year just based on who's coming out the other side of training and the consultant jobs available. Um, so even though the numbers seem small, they do change every year. So keep an eye on that. So let's go through the scoring matrix. How can you make yourself competitive as possible? So the first part of the matrix is just the training post that you've held. So if you're applying an F2, you'll get a default one point. Um, and it just goes to show that if you're not successful first time, don't despair because you get two points for showing the career progression beyond foundation relevant to cardiothoracics. So if you've done a fellowship in surgery or cardiothoracic surgery or shown that you're um, pursuing a career in that by locoming, um, you'll score two points. They then look at your undergraduate career. Um, so up to three points for having an exceptional undergraduate career or national prizes. So have you got a distinction or honours in your medical degree? Have any of your coursework received a prize? Um, have you submitted um, essay prizes? Um, have you received, um, and I didn't know this, that elective bursaries count as awards and prizes, so they count. 
um, have you done any undergraduate research or audits um, and you know have you submitted those to conferences and achieved prizes so you can score there's a lot, a lot of points there to score for a number of different things in your undergraduate career they then score you on your electives and your attachments up to two points for showing a major commitment to cardiothoracic surgery so that's your student electives um, student selected components if you're keen on surgery and um, try and do those in surgery and particularly in cardiothoracics if you're interested in that um, and up to two points um, but it doesn't matter if you choose to do cardiothoracics later on um, in foundation it, you can score a point for having an elective over two weeks in cardiothoracics so if you do your taste a week in foundation in cardiothoracics um, or you study leave that you have left over to, to um, go and shadow cardiothoracics and um, you can still get a point um, so you, you you know, you're not disadvantaged from deciding late. Um, then they'll score your higher degrees. So if you do a BMSI or a Bachelor of Surgical Science or a Master's, that can score, uh, well actually Master's scores you more points, you'll get a point. You get the most points for having completed a Master's or a PhD, it's up to three. Um, but if that's a work in progress, you're, you're working towards the Master's, particularly with research in cardiothoracic surgery, that scores you two points. Um, but if you're registered for doing a higher degree, that gets your point. So there's a lot of points available there. And it's really important to include in that application anything that's in progress because it scores you points don't leave it out if it's not completed that can be a mistake um, then they look at your other degrees and diplomas are you doing a diploma in education or leadership or research not counted in the masters um, uh, that can you can get up to two points for doing two or more of those and they're particularly interested if they're relevant to cardiothoracics and um, so basic surgical sciences um, or surgery it's important to note here in bold that the membership exams are don't count towards these points when I applied and um, they did so I was shocked when I looked at this is the most recent matrix and um, but it might be worth still sitting those exams in foundation and I'll talk about why later um, but you won't be scored points on that um, and you're not disadvantaged if you don't don't have those exams I didn't when I applied and I still got appointed they'll then look at any other research you've done after medical school that's not related to your masters um, so just things you're doing in fellowship or during your attachments um, they'll then look at any postgraduate awards and prizes so have you presented at a national conference and uh, received an award and again that doesn't have to be in cardiothoracics or surgery it can be any specialty or, or uh, a scientific conference um, so if you decide to to uh, do cardiothoracics late and you, you worry about your CV, do you have anything in, in any specialty? It will be relevant. It's just showing skills and academic achievement. They'll want to look at your courses. Um, so up to two points for showing a strong commitment to cardiothoracic career or surgical career. And that's your basic surgical skills course, ATLS, the start surgery course. Um, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Um, they just want to show progression towards surgery. Um, then you can score up to two points for presentations. The highest points are for an oral presentation at a national or international level. So that's like the SCTS annual meeting. But again, it doesn't have to be cardiothoracics. It can be any, any oral presentation at a national level and any specialty. Um, you'd get a point um, for presenting regionally or locally um, and points for having poster presentations at national meetings. Um, so don't discount those oral presentations at local or regional meetings. Um, do put them in the application because they do score points. They'll then look at your publications. You get the most points for having first named author papers, three or more, um, or um, authors of book chapters relevant to cardiothoracic surgery. Um, you get the most points. Um, but if you're first named author in a single paper or named in multiple papers um, or, or multiple textbooks, um, you still get two points. Um, and they, again, these don't have to be cardiothoracics. You get more points if they are, um, but um, they don't have to be related to cardiothoracics. Um, it's worth mentioning that case studies count as first named author publications. They're not easy to do, but might be slightly easier if you don't have research. So have a look whilst you're a medical student um, and in foundation if there's any interesting cases that might be relevant for publication. Um, and submit them. There's also a number of um, websites and journals that are looking for editors at a junior level also um, and that counts. Clinical audit, um, you get up to three points for showing sustained commitment to clinical audit. Um, what that means is um, closing the loop 
um, where you um, audit current practice against the standards such as NICE guidelines, think of a way in, in, in which you can improve the service, implement that change and then re-audit to see if you've made a difference and that's called closing the loop and they're looking for that sort of in more than one occasion um, but you still score points if you've led and designed an audit or shown regular commitment in audit. Um, they're looking at your leadership skills. You get up to three points for having a leadership role in a national committee um, or have led on a major project or expedition. So a number of you today who've been involved in organising this will already have three points there. Um, but if you're the chair uh, or, or leadership role in your local society, so your surgical society, that also gets you two points. There's a lot of points to be had for leadership positions. And again, this doesn't have to be inside of medicine. It can be outside of medicine, any sports or hobbies, the way you're on a, a committee, that counts. Um, and if you do regular committee work or charity work or haven't had a leadership role per se, that still scores your points. And that brings you on to the next part, practical and psychomotor skills. This is outside of medicine and uh, things that you might have achieved. It's up to three points. Now, we're not all Olympic swimmers or um, national footballers, um, which isn't sort of maximum points. But are you achieving in sports and uh, art or music? Do you play a musical instrument? You know, these things are relevant. This is part of the application where I don't mind saying I didn't realise the things that I did were relevant, which they might be. So do, do think about that. Do you do anything that can count towards? those points. Teaching, um, they want to see um, a major commitment to teaching that scores you three points um, and or national courses or national teaching. So like today if you, you're involved in organising a national teaching meeting that counts. If you've organised your undergraduate surgical conference that counts and again it doesn't have to be medicine, They're just uh, surgical, sorry, surgery sorry, it, it all counts. Um, if you've designed and set up um, sort of departmental teaching for juniors um, and run that on a regular basis. Again, that's a major commitment to surgery and uh, to teaching. And we'll get you the most points, um, but you do get points for showing regular commitment to teaching or regional teaching, and that still gets you points. But to score the maximum, they want to look at sort of organising and developing a teaching program or a national meeting um, or doing courses. They'll then look at your surgical procedures and operative experience. So there's a part of the application where they'll want to know how many incisions and closures you've done. It's procedures like appendicectomies because um, they know that not all um, will have had jobs in cardiothoracic. So they're looking at sort of orthopedic, general surgery procedures and cardiothoracic procedures you might have done. Um, so I'll talk about this a bit later, but it's important to keep your logbook as you go along and start that now if you haven't already. Um, keep um, a logbook of, of, of procedures that you've, you've either observed or been involved in and put in there uh, in the blank space in there what you've done so that when it comes to doing this um, you've already got it there for you so you don't have to to, um, to start that later um, that's up to three points um, then there's your personal statement um, and overall impression of the application. So if you've shown that throughout the application that through all these domains that you're really committed to a career in cardiothoracic surgery and surgery in general, um, you, you, know, you can score up to three points for that. And the personal statement is sort of a, a, a white space area to really explain why you want to do cardiothoracic surgery, you know, what makes um, you are a good candidate for the role um, and, and also an opportunity for anything that hasn't fit elsewhere in the application that you think is relevant um, to, to put in there um, and that's really where a mentor will come in handy to read your personal statement and help you with it because I don't know about you but I'm not great at selling myself and talking about myself and um, so it was really helpful to have someone to go through my personal statement and go I know this might embarrass you but you need to put this and that was really helpful um, so this matrix is there on the website you can use it now score yourself where are you scoring where are you weakest where can you develop your cv to really get the most points and um, you know if you where can you focus on and just regularly score yourself um, throughout your you know your foundation and career your medical school career um, just so you know where you are at and um, keep a cv as you go along with all these activities so it's all there um, and for anything that you put down in your application from this matrix, um, you need evidence for. And I'd really advise getting that evidence at the time, whether that be sort of a certificate of participation in audit or a letter to say you've had a leadership role from the organisation or um, 
sort of feedback forms from the teaching uh you, you need evidence and i'd keep it as you go along if i had a, a folder i kept all the paper copies in and i scanned them electronically so i had electronic copies just in case and anything electronic i printed off vice versa um and kept it safe um you know you if you you don't want to be coming to the application and the interview and sort of struggling to find evidence um from years ago and having to go back and get things in so to be organized ahead of time and plan for it so what does my journey look like um so i'm a bit of a strange one in that i wanted to be a surgeon and particularly a cardiothoracic surgeon from um uh, from the age of 13. um i was part of a widening participation scheme at my university to get into medical school um, and as a, a school student i had a talk from a cardiothoracic surgeon and it just inspired me that's what i wanted to do um i did look at other medicine and surgical careers during medical school did i want to do that but no it was cardiothoracics for me um and so what did i do at medical school um i joined the surgical society and took up leadership positions on that committee uh, working my way up to president in my next to final year um, that was a, a really great way um, of scoring points in the matrix um, i did enjoy it also um, but we set up and organized our national um, undergraduate conference surgical conference at our university um, it also afforded me opportunities to teach clinical skills and anatomy um, so it's a, a great way of broadening your cv um, i also joined the peer teaching society to gain teaching experience I tried to make the most out of my surgical attachments at medical school, trying to do audits and present where I could. I got my affiliation to the Royal College of Surgeons, which is free and can recommend. There's four surgical colleges, I believe, Glasgow, Ireland, uh, Edinburgh and England, um, which are free. And they advertise to you relevant courses and conferences uh, for you to attend. SCCS student affiliation is also free um, and they will again invite you to relevant courses and conferences and um, so it's good to do and keeps you in touch with what you can do. So I went to all the careers days and forums and meetings that I could for both the Royal College of Surgeons and um, SCTS during that time uh, and like a number of you today joined the student engagement committee. I joined my medical squash society. Now, it wasn't international level at all, um, but it was a psychomotor skill. I just wanted to do it for fun. And I also got a leadership position on that committee. Um, I wanted to give back to the widening participation scheme. So I took an ambassadorship, which involved teaching students. Um, I also chose to intercalate and I did a BMED Sci in cardiothoracic surgery um, in my clinical years. You don't have to do one, but I found it really useful to teach new research skills. I also um, managed to go to theatre during that time um, to gain operative skills and experience in cardiothoracics. Um, I also got a first named paper out of it and national presentations orally and posters. Um, so I found it a really useful way of, of, of gaining that experience and those um, CV points by doing it but you don't have to you can do it outside of a BMN side yourself um, I also joined as a national research um, committee called Star Surge, um, which is national audits and took a leadership position on that just to get an um, audit experience and named publication and I did all of my electives in cardiothoracics and surgery and um, so my six-week SSC I did an audit um, however my nine week elective abroad was in peru and at the time there was a national strike and they were only doing emergency surgery um so i didn't do it in cardiothoracics just because of lack of exposure i ended up doing it in general surgery um, but it was still relevant it was surgery um i went around orthopedics general surgery and i also kept in touch with the cardiothoracic surgeon who took me on his rounds of his emergency patients just to to carry on um but um if you apply again for bursary prizes they count as awards, which I didn't know when I first applied, did the second time around. Um, and I did my um, final year elective at James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough in the North East Deanery. Um, I met Johnny Ferguson at our national conference and he invited me to come for two weeks to go to theatre um, and gain operative experience. Um, he's now my TPD. It's funny how these things turn out. Um, and that, that programme has now been set up because it, it worked for me and worked for the department is now run regularly throughout the year in conjunction with RCS Edinburgh and James Cook. It's really worthwhile doing and I would recommend um, to anyone you know, here listening today to apply for that elective. Um, 
Then during foundation, um, I carried on doing audits and closing the loop on an audit each year. Um, I took up a foundation trust rep leadership role in foundation year one. Um, I, throughout both years, did courses relevant to cardiothoracics and surgery, the basic surgical skills in year two. Um, I also went to the SCTS Essential Skills in Cardiothoracic Surgery course, which is um, knowledge and skill stations. And there's also a talk about applying for cardiothoracic training, um, like I'm doing today at that course. Um, I found it really useful. Um, it's also worth mentioning that if you do it in foundation, you can't attend then in ST2, which is run for the ST2s, but it doesn't matter, you will have already done it. Um, but if, if you don't go in foundation, it will be available to you in your training programme. Um, I organised teaching for medical students throughout foundation. I did my taste a week in cardiothoracic surgery um, and I continued to attend SCTS meetings. I also started the Edinburgh Surgical Science Qualification, which is run through the University of Edinburgh and the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. It's a three year part time long distance course um, where you do the certificate in year one, diploma in year two and the masters in year three. Um, and uh, it also prepares you for the MRCS exam. Um, like I said, I didn't get in in FY2, so I took a year out. Um, and what did I do with that year out? Um, I took a research junior fellowship um, in spine surgery. Um, I couldn't find one in cardiothoracics, also due to my personal circumstances, I couldn't move, um, so I had to stay where I was. Um, but it might be worth looking at moving around um, the country to, to do a fellowship. Um, that afforded me more clinical experience. I had my own clinic um, and my own designated training list in theatre um, to sort of improve my professionalism and development as a, as a trainee. Um, it also afforded me uh, publications, audits and research and presentations. Um, I also was able to complete my master's during that time and I did my research in cardiothoracics. Um, I also had an agreement with the local cardiothoracic department and my supervisor that I could attend cardiothoracic theatres in my spare time just to keep up that commitment to the specialty. Um, I did further courses that I hadn't done. I looked at my CV and thought where are my weaknesses and I did the ATLS course, the start surgery course. I'd recommend doing that start surgery course um, in foundation year one or two. I think it's more relevant for, for the more junior you are. Um, I also thought my weakness was in teaching. I didn't realise that organising a national conference got you full points, um, which I'd already done, um, but just didn't think to put on my application form. Um, definitely get help with this application. Um, so I set up some departmental teaching in orthopaedics for my junior junior colleagues um, and ran that um, and that got maximum points. Um, and I also continued to uh, attend the CTS and get involved in teaching on those days. And like everyone else in their year out, I wanted to do some travel and um, I couldn't take too much time off but on my annual leave. Um, I went back to Peru on a volunteer surgical mission wasn't cardiothoracics but it was general surgery and um, transferable skills and um, just to give back to that community that helped me on my elective and um, we did cover cystectomies and in hernia repairs um, and lumpectomies um, and if anyone wants to talk to me about um, volunteer missions I'm happy to be contacted. Um, so breaking down the scoring what can you do so at medical school if you work hard and get distinction or honours that's worth putting points. Make the most out of those electives and SSCs as there are audits and research you can do. Can you then submit that to conferences? Can you publish it? Um, teaching and get involved in your peer teaching society. Um, get your affiliations with the Royal Colleges um, SETS. There's also ASSET, Associations of Surgeons Training. They advertise skills courses and, and careers days and courses relevant at, at medical school um, and, and I'd advise doing them. Um, there's also um, positions of responsibility you could take up during your societies and take on leadership roles. Um, is intercalation something you want to do? Um, is it worth doing and um, really think about how that might be of an advantage to you and find a mentor early on, um, a cardiothoracic surgeon or um, consultant that you trust that you can work hard for and they'll work hard for you and just help you through that application process, someone who can help you with research and audits. What can you do in foundation? It says here do the MRCS. Now you don't have to, again I didn't have my exams in foundation um, when I applied and I did them in ST1, ST2. A number of my core surgical counterparts also did that and, and, and uh, specialty trainees do that. Um, it's not a disadvantage but what I will say is that if you have a job in foundation that's um, nine to five or you have your weekends off, 
like GP or psychiatry that you, you might have three months where you can revise hard for the exam because it does take a few months to revise the exam and you could do your part A during that time and it just means that when you're in specialty training you're then doing your, just your part B um, and then you can sort of hit the ground running with operating quicker you don't have to um, but it's an opportunity I think you get five attempts at part A and four attempts at part B um, but it says there at the bottom don't concentrate on MRCS part B I'd advise not doing that in foundation you really need clinical experience um, so it's worth doing that when you're in your core or specialty training years one and two and uh, just so you've got more clinical experience it's also expensive um, and you know you only have a certain number of attempts so I'd save that later can you teach medical students do your surgical skills courses your ATLS courses there's also courses in teaching and leadership and there's the cardiothoracic advanced life support as well if you're interested in doing that you can do that in foundation are there case reports you can publish and um, do good clinical um, looped audits maybe take up a trust rep or a rotor rep responsibility make the most out of that taste a week you get in foundation um it's also if you've not used up all your study leave and um, for exams and courses you can use that and make the most out of your study leave days and, and go to cardiothoracics and that's really important that if you've decided late you can you can have that as a clinical elective experience attend conferences regularly SETS um, and try and submit to present um, it's an opportunity to try and win prizes and there's also the Edward Jenner Leadership Fellowship, which is free part-time distance fellowship in, in leadership, which also is a good idea for getting points. And again, don't despair if you don't get in an FY2. I didn't, and, and you, you just keep at it and try. And um, I'm a, uh, an example of that you can still be successful later. So handy tips and advice I wish I'd had. Make the most out of those electives, or that audits or research you can do, um, and keep a logbook. Um, e -logbook org is free it's validated by the four royal colleges it's also linked to the surgical portfolio we keep as trainees when you graduate and get your gmc number you can contact them and link it to your gmc number and carries it all through that's even observed cases because it's showing a commitment to surgery so keep that now if you're going to theater and observing cases put those in there and it's really important that if you are scrubbing in and, and doing things um, and assisting write exactly what you've done in the blank space on there so when it comes to working out what you've done it's all in there and I really recommend again with keeping evidence that you uh, with each surgical placement or elective you print this logbook anonymizing it removing the patient details which you can do on the website um, and printing it off and getting it signed by your supervisor and stamped by the hospital um, because again when it comes to having this for the, you need it for the interview your portfolio for the interview if you don't have that it's difficult to then go back to people you've worked with in the past it's particularly abroad and to get those signed um, so that's worth doing and keeping um, join your societies um, take up leadership roles and um, again get those affiliations to the societies um, surgical societies because um, it's free and you get access to resources that are so helpful um, do your courses um, basic surgical skills ATLS ALS is mandatory um, there is a course called the care of the critically ill surgical patients um, I wouldn't advise doing that in foundation because there's so many other courses you can do to get the points it's expensive you have to do it by the end of CT2 or ST2 so the deanery pays for it um, and it's more relevant at that time in your training also so I would, uh, I would avoid doing that one and do the others um, but that's just my personal advice um, do um, loot audits regularly show commitment to audit and um, do think about your foundation jobs. I didn't have a foundation job in cardiothoracic surgery. I did two surgical rotations though. Um, I again got appointed and it wasn't a disadvantage but what I would say is that my counterparts that did have an FY2 job in cardiothoracics had more confidence and experience and sort of hit the ground running a bit bit faster you can catch up I did so it's, if you don't it's not a disadvantage it just might be helpful and um, but the job numbers do vary per deanery so it's worth thinking would you move for the job um, and, and is that important to you and, and that, when it comes to fellowships again and um, have a look for cardiothoracic fellowships and um, have a look for surgical fellowships think about moving out of area to do those um, and use the matrix score yourself on a regular basis and um, look at your weaknesses and sort of work on that and keep your cv as you go 
go along and, and again keep your evidence as you go along keep it safe um, and find that mentor early on a consultant um, that you can work with on projects and will just help you through the application process and when it comes to the interviews, there are interview courses, um, some free, some you can pay for. Um, I didn't do a course, but what I did do was my supervisor at the time did a mock interview for me. And that was really helpful because most of us won't have interviewed since medical school. It's really different um, and it just gives you tips and advice on how you can improve and what the process is like. And that brings me on to the resource I was talking about. Um, I'm not um, anyway on the take or getting any funding for saying this, and there are other books available, but myself and a number of colleagues have used this textbook um, on interview skills which is relevant up to registrar interviews and there's different structured ways of answering different types of questions at interview and it shows you that structure um, and examples of questions so that you can write your answers um, and practice them ahead of time. Um, thank you for listening to me and thank you to the committee for inviting me to talk today. Um, just some pictures of the Freeman team at the beach and the James Cook team at the ball uh, and I couldn't resist a picture of my dog. Um, my email address is charlotte.homes9 at nhs.net. I'm happy to be contacted for any further advice or information. Thank you. Charlotte, it's Karen. Thank you so much for that really engaging and really useful talk. So um, is it useful to know that the James Cook team are all in bow ties or is the Freeman career at the beach? Does that does that mean anything? <laughs> no, no, it's just um, uh, uh, we didn't go to the beach at James Cook. Um, I don't know <laughs> where it is in Middlesbrough. Um, <laughs> um, no. and, uh, it is indeed um, a small world because um, Joel was my SHO, not my personal SHO, in Manchester and Johnny Ferguson seemed to end up at my wedding, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> How to navigate the question. Well Charlotte, it's not going to be a huge surprise to know that you've got the most questions that have come through the Q&A because oh. it's the most, most practical um, talk really for the students at that stage. So I will run through these um, if that's okay. So let's just start with the ones I haven't managed to get through so far. So if you organise an international medical conference, does that count for full points uh, in one section? Yes, um, I believe so. If you organise a national conference or meeting that has an educational component, I think that gets you four points. And again, it doesn't have to be in cardiothoracics. How many courses do you actually need? So do you need all the recognised surgical courses or do you sc score full marks just for attending one? Um, I think they want to see a sustained commitment, so it's usually more than one, you don't have to do them all, um, but they want to see regular career progression, so your basic surgical skills course, um, your ATLS course, they're all courses that you need to do in your surgical career, so they want to see you commit into that um, and, and just showing a commitment to surgery, so it's more than one but you don't have to do them all. Charlotte, what would you say about finding a cardiothoracic surgical rotation in foundation programme? Which do you think is the nationally best placed course? Oh, um, I, ooh, I can't say where the nationally best course are. Um, I know there's a number of different foundation jobs um, across the country. Um, it's worth looking when you're applying for foundation, you can sort it by specialty and have a look. Um, uh, I can say that the North East is very good, I can say Yorkshire is very good, um, I'm speaking to my colleagues nationally, everywhere is really good, so there isn't anywhere in particular, um, but the, the jobs will be advertised um, with the foundation programmes. I think I would add in to there that if there's a particular area in cardiothoracic surgery that you wanted to specialise in, you should really seek out training in that region, that's probably the best advice for that. Uh, so do you still get points for registering for an MSc, even if you haven't completed it? Yes, um, so in the application form, um, put where you are at with that MSc. Um, so if it's part time and you're in the certificate year or the diploma year, put that in there and explain where you're at. Um, you still get points for being part way through um, and you get more points if your research is in cardiothoracics. So do mention that if your dissertation is going to be in that that's what it is, is and you'll get more points for that. Um, you don't have to have completed it, but if you have completed it, that's when you get the maximum points. What's the best way to get involved in research at medical school? Um, 
there are a number of research collaboratives. In my region, there was a surgical research collaborative. Um, there are student research societies. Um, there are academic societies at university. There's lots of different routes into it. So have a look at what's available to you locally. Um, if you're interested in surgery or cardiothoracics, um, as most of you will be today, um, there is the, the national uh, surgical research bodies as well. Um, and, and just um, have a look for those. In terms of what teaching counts, um, someone was under the impression that unless you're teaching to medical students it does not count, but does it matter who you're teaching to in courses? Um, I don't believe that it, it matters who you're teaching to, it just matters that you have a regular commitment to teaching, whether that be medical students or their students, um, it, it doesn't have to be within medicine, it can be outside medicine also, so if you're and uh, teaching outside of medicine uh, in something that's passionate to you, that counts. Um, but they just want to see a regular commitment and organisation of teaching. So lots and lots of thank yous for a very good talk. And uh, someone has just asked um, at interview, what's the total score, Charlotte, that you need to be offered a job? Um, I don't think there is a particular total score to offer a job. It's um, the a ranking amongst everyone at interview, I believe. Um, I, don't, I think there's more information about that on the Wessex Deanery website, but I think it's mostly about um, ranking amongst your peers at interview. Um, so how many conferences do I need to, to organise before I would score maximum points? I think we've already answered uh, that one. Yeah, enough. I think one's enough. Okay, that's really super. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, there's a couple of other questions that maybe uh, pitched towards Simon, but unless there's anything else, I think that was really good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great, Karen. Did you say there were a number of other questions? Charlotte, I think I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and say that was brilliant. Um, I wanted to just mention, because I have my Wales hat on and it's blowing a gale here, that uh, we have uh, F1 and F2 are, are two separate things and we do have F2 posts in cardiothoracic so it's not to and join other things some of you who are joining want to be cardiothoracic surgeons uh, but some of you might just want to be interested in surgery so join things like ACID which I didn't do when I was younger but I found out about Association of Surgeons in Training projects like Star Surge, you know, there's lots of ways you can get involved. Uh, I obviously have another Royal College of Surgeons of England hat on, but like you said, there are four colleges, so get involved. And one thing I do want to say, which might not be directly related at the moment, but there was, with all COVID, we know we don't live in, an, in a vacuum or in a silo, we're part of a bigger sort of, um, uh, the biggest, bigger society. There was a bit of a kerfuffle, I think, in certain specialties because there were no interviews last year and people went on scoring. And, and I'm not saying big up yourself if inappropriately, but there is evidence that certain groups of people don't, you know, promote themselves and, and it's, uh, you know, certain genders don't promote themselves as well. So, you know, I think you did a really comprehensive thing of all the little bits you do that you might not think are relevant. They are because it's showing your commitment to whatever specialty. You, you can teach uh, PAs, nurses, um, healthcare assistants. It doesn't matter. That still is a commitment to teaching, for example. So, um, so I think that was brilliant. Um, Karen, did you say there were some questions that were pertaining to our president? Yes, yeah, so there was, in one second, you know, I'm honoured. Um, so just as one really interesting question, what's the impact on training uh, with regards to the increased use of minimally invasive surgery and robotic surgery? Will that make it harder to train in cardiothoracic surgery? I thought the panel could maybe answer that one. Yeah, really good question. Um, I'd, I'd say for the, for the students, I think as a specialty, we are really reflecting on training now and various factors have impacted on training and the quality of training. Um, so uh, there's slightly uh, less activity, not just because of COVID, but before COVID, um, there is less cardiac surgical activity and the activity that we do do is more complex and difficult. 
Uh, also, um, the impact on surgeon outcomes being monitored means that um, if a trainer is, is havering between giving a case or not, uh, they may tend not to, which, which has an impact on training. Uh, and of course, uh, we've got uh, middle grade rotors uh, of SAS doctors and NTNs um, who are all competing for the same operating exposure. And um, we, are, we are currently debating that we probably need to change the model of service delivery, that we need to give allied health professionals the ability to progress and to deliver the service, which will allow the surgical trainee to spend less time in their later years being resident on call and doing service tasks and spend more time in theatre. And Karen, to get to your question, I think that will let them have the time to learn their skills uh, robotically or minimally invasively. Um, it, it's about time in theatre, it's about time doing your craft. Uh, and, and I think as a specialty, we really have to work together across all the units to deliver that, uh, to get that consistency. That's great, Simon, thank you.